It's either that or you can come into my, my apartment and play bar mitzvah. Speaking of which, the, uh, you know, the CD's really great. I was actually trying to deconstruct. That they're responsible for such hits as uh, Reeling in the Years, Ricky Don't Lose That Number, and uh, Hey 19. And they're out now with a new album called Two Against Nature, which uh, took them about uh, 19 years or 20 years or so to make. What is up with that? Why did it take you so long? Well, uh, we didn't do much the first uh, 17 and a half years. We were just thinking about it. First time I heard Sully Dan, um, grew up in Northern California, driving along the coast with my parents. Just hanging out uh, in their pickup truck, driving through the woods uh, in rural Massachusetts, and uh, they popped in a tape. I was in the back seat of my mom's car when we were going to school, and it, uh, the first song I heard was Richard Dawkins. First thing they asked me is I was 15, I was rummaging through some of my mom's old tapes and uh, happened upon Asia. I was a fan since then. In a bikini by the pool listening to Hey 19 when I was 16. And I didn't get it. <laughs> Feels like I've always been listening to Steely Dan. Oh, I was listening to it when I was living on my friend's brown sexual sofa. Um, Tina Holt. I was a little kid. Uh, I heard, uh, I think it was the year of the cat. On oh, my, uh, I hit my father. Actually, that's Al Stewart. No. The it is. Yeah. <laughs> we first heard Steely Dan when we were 17. We went to a concert in Shoreline Amphitheater. So you hear them live, though? Yeah. Yeah. What do you remember? I remember. You tell them. <laughs> the whole audience is going like this. It was great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Green earrings, thank you. Appreciate it. Two Against Nature, is it in any way a departure from your other works, or is there, is there something new that fans of yours might be surprised by? The secret messages are in there, messages. buried in the lyrics. Walter plays most of the guitar solos. I guess I was nine years old or ten years old, and I got, I was given my grandmother's radio and then uh, got to listen to, you know, tune in a rock and roll stations, which included all kinds of weird New Orleans stuff and doo-wop stuff and uh, jazz. It was so exciting. Yeah, it was so incredibly exciting, and it also had a sound to it, you know, an incredible, you know, ambience that, you know, obviously were parts of whole styles and musical traditions uh, that I knew nothing about, full of emotion. Sex sex and emotion and, you know, weird teenage lore. Cousin Dupree is uh, kind of a traditional kind traditional, of traditional, fun country sort of tune. And uh, uh, yeah, we have a little story in there, you know, that's, uh, you know, maybe a little, as my father would say, risque.
you very much. Cousin Dupree. Little uh, rural narrative. Why do you think relatively few artists introduce humor to their songs? No sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you, when you came together for this album, did you bring your, your wealth of knowledge from your previous work, or did you feel that you had evolved as musicians and you wanted to try something new, completely new? Um, did we learn anything from a... <laughs> I, I, other stuff? I, I think we probably did, but we forgot a lot of yeah. it as we were going along. So which of the previous albums do you regard with um, personal most satisfaction and why? I think Kind of Blue was my favorite. Okay, this is something, an idea, the long-cherished idea of Donald and mine, that we would have our own public access TV okay. show. Good. <laughs> no, no, just kick somebody Great. in. Great. And then uh, they're going to bring in some kind of... Oh you want to tell the band really that we're not going to be playing anymore today? No, we are. We're going to do this really quick. Hi, we're back again, so and this is, this is my friend Donald Fagan. <laughs> and this is uh, Walter Becker, and we're here with uh, uh, one of the uh, musicians in our band. Uh, this year, which camera should I be looking in? Miss Vicky Cave. Glad to have you with us, Vicky. It's good to be here. Now, tell me, how did you get in a situation like this? <laughs> in a situation like this? You asked me to come in the room. Uh, well, I, I meant more generally speaking, you know. Generally like what were you doing right before you were in our band? Right before I was in your band, I was and still am doing a cabaret. <clears throat> cabaret. Broadway I show. actually knew that, but for the sake of the <laughs> show, I wanted to. Just ask the question. Yeah. All right, get out of here, okay? <laughs> and uh, Thanks, send guys. someone else in, okay? Really? Send Carolyn in, actually, I because... I right. Carolyn in. She'll be far more interesting than us. Okay.
Thank you, a bad sneaker, that's a real New York sort of number. Kind of a local deal. It was one of those things that uh, I guess what we can classify as adult contemporary radio right now and smooth jazz. It's funky, it's jazzy, it's mellow, it's, it's got a lot of heart, you know? And it's got a great sense of humor. You could say it's blue-eyed soul, you could say it's jazz, you could say it's one of the blues. It's a, it's just a lot of things. You know? It's really the, the, the Fagan, Fagan riffs and uh, old Michael McDonald voice. A lot of nice chunky horns, smooth horns, that was good stuff. I guess the voicey falsettos, man, you know. It still rocks, you know what I mean? It still rocks and funks at the same time. But I'm Ryan Steele again, right up there with Madonna and Bach is some of my favorite music. And ironically, I just came back from a film festival out in the mountains. I rented a car, of course there's no CD player. So I stopped in the gas station, and what do I pick up? Steely Dan's greatest hits. It's just kind of like that chill out music that just gives you the kind of, it's kind of that laid back mood. That's like, it's always been a, it's been kind of timeless. It's fun, it's quite fun. And uh, just sticks. Did they, did they play Woodstock 94? No. No, they didn't.
Jersey, thank you. Thanks very much. But is the relationship between you and your instrument one just because it's an ex like say you have an exp an expensive bass and a much less expensive? Do you feel like more intimate with the more expensive one? Well, you, you should, but there's no you know you, you you know you can have like a plywood right. bass and it sounds great, but uh, hopefully the more expensive instrument would be the better right. one. Right. So you but you could call it the relations of production really. Mm, well, sense. let's look at it this way. Suppose the bass was a hooker, right? Exactly. And let's say you got a thousand dollar a night hooker right. versus a hundred dollar a night hooker, right? Right. The hundred dollar a night hooker has what? A heart of gold, right? So That's which true. one? Do, right. Which one? You know. Which one do you take home to mother? <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of mother, let's look at it from yeah. a Freudian uh -huh. angle for a second. Like it's funny that Tom made that jump right there to mother. Yeah, from the was, hook yeah, That's yeah, why I was I was okay. aware of that too, but. But um, if you look at the, the instruments as like, especially like people have, guitar players have, you know, 20, 25, 30, 75 instruments, uh, uh, are these, you know, transitional objects, that is to say fetishes, which goes back to some, something having to do with inadequate mothering or something like that? Uh, can you repeat that? No. Okay. I, I, you lost I mean, me. in sort of the Winnicott sense of a transition. Yeah, let's look at it in object, object relations. Object uh, relations sense. He's coming second. from an object relations perspective you know on saying? this. In other words, rather than say, you know. You know how when you're young and, you know, like so kids will have their blankie or their yeah, yeah. teddy bear or, I mean, it's possible that, that uh, you know, you're, you're an adult, but you still have these things that you're attached to in a certain way, which, which make you feel a certain way. You know yeah, what I'm saying? The need for the binky. 
Yeah, binky, yeah. right. The That's binky. the perfect the example, right? right. For the binky. So is that, you know, is that nice, you know, yeah. ESP base with the quilted maple uh, yes, top sir. there, is that a binky? That's is that binky the question? Binky number one. Binky number one. That's correct. Cool. Yeah. Some somewhere between a nerd and a and a uh, Schmendrick. Schmendrick. You know, I was sort of the, didn't fit in on any level, sort of really. Also, I liked jazz when I was pretty young. My father had uh, bought a hi-fi sometime around 1958 or 59, and he had like three or four records, and one of them happened to be a uh, Dave Brubeck record, and there was just these long, you know beautiful Paul Desmond solos on this thing. That's how I started listening to uh, to jazz. I mean, the two of them, it just that they are such jazz buffs. It's ridiculous. And the irony is, is that a lot of guys who are hardcore jazz musicians sometimes dream of being like heavy rock and rollers. And in this way, these guys who are uh, whatever, rock, pop, soul, they dream of being in a dingy basement playing an upright piano and like 
you know, West Montgomery kind of guitar. So they just put together everything that they love. Grooves, incredible. Both of them were literature majors or something, so they love sort of storytelling and uh, sort of jazz-influenced harmonies. It seems to me that they're doing is basically just writing from their heart and what they actually feel. Because it covers, as far as I'm concerned, so many different areas. You know, there's a bit of R&B, there's a bit of uh, jazz in terms of a lot of the chord progressions and the way they kind of glue them together. But then they'll turn around and do a blues. They, they have an amazing chemistry, so you can't, you can't always expect to take them a certain way and cause, because they'll never do what you expect them to do. <laughs> Donald reminds me of my dad. Um, I, I find them both easy to be around, uh, but I get that Donald's sh shy and like mm -hmm. my father, very witty and very uh, at home in his work, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, very uh, just made of music. And through and through, both of them. Shit. 
of the songs are more stories. Personal. Yeah. You know, stories. than they've been, not that they haven't before, but I think mm -hmm. like a lot of the older lyrics are about like sex and drugs. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, oh no, they are. But you could talk to 10 different people and you know, there's like 10 different, 10 different inter interpretations, yeah, interpretations lyrics, of what the song is about. So I figured that, that maybe there's those codes in the songs. It's the only one you've got. You might use it if you feel better when you get home. I always wondered, what does that mean? What are they talking about? For me, when I hear the lyrics, I don't usually laugh. Sometimes there's like a small weeping. And somebody said that they were aliens that were uh, uh, or they were beamed up by aliens. That's why they have such good music and stuff like that. You know, it's it's very possible. Elusiveness. See, I always thought being like a backup singer, if, you know, we all did this full time. Mm -hmm. We definitely have to be in this CIA because this is the best cover you could ever dream of. <laughs> no? <laughs> exactly. And there's just so much downtime on the road. I'm Come not on. smart enough. <laughs> we're all smart enough.
Thanks very much. Black Friday. Okay, fine, fine, man, fine. It's fine, okay? It's fine. <laughs> Cornelius was talking about the fact that he plays in the subway regularly mm -hmm. uh, to get a certain feeling. So you think that's valuable? Yes, yeah, so Cornelius has got some weird thing with the subways. We got. Okay, fine. I won't move. I'm doing some interviews here. Gentlemen. Okay. What about us? Aren't you going to say hello to us? Well, I, I just meant in a general way, you know. Cornelius Bumpus. Are we rolling? Always. We're okay. always rolling. Now, there seems to be, you know, a sort of a, uh, I, I don't know how to say it, a kind of a, uh, a uh, how would you describe it, between Cornelius and, and, and some of the other band members, and maybe even between Cornelius and us, a kind of, I don't know, tension, or not, not maybe not a real tension, a sort of a faux tension. It's really. sort of a gruff repartee, I would describe it. You right. Know? It's kind but of, com sort, yeah, it's kind of like a camaraderie. I think we have to go back to uh, we have to go back in time yes. to uh, if we're really going to shed any light on this. What was your first uh, Cornelius? What was your first professional engagement as a musician? This is from the tension thing. Got back to the first gig. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're, we're gonna be jumping around in okay. time. Don't let okay. that bother you. I got though. you. Okay. It's just like a film. They can do that. You, you see, know? modern, okay. modern, um, you know, know, psychoanalytic you... theory um, posits the notion that uh, many of the uh, keys to present-day uh, situations are are to be discovered in the past. My in first a, uh, gig. Exhaustive analysis of the uh, events. And uh, that's and perhaps that the... even going back as far as childhood. And that the the we don't have time to do here now. And that the unconscious always says yes. So. Rem be aware of that while you're, while you're, uh, you know, digging, digging. Can I go now? If I get now, I'm...
to introduce the, uh, thank you, the entire band uh, to my immediate right, a uh, new member of our band this year, a wonderful guitar player, as you've already discovered, from New York City. Please welcome John Harrington. Uh, behind uh, John on the uh, horn riser tonight, a wonderful musician, wonderful guy, and a veteran of many of our bands and many other famous bands of the 70s. Please welcome Cornelius Bumpus. Uh, next to Cornelius, um, a player that solos uh, are featured on uh, our new record, uh, Two Against Nature. Please welcome Chris Potter. Uh, playing the trumpet tonight. Uh, great musician, great trumpet player, great arranger. Please welcome Michael Lenhart. Trombone, another wonderful player who's uh, all over our uh, new record and uh, going to be touring with us this summer. Please welcome Jim Pugh. <laughs> Moving over into the uh, rhythm section, uh, our uh, drummer featured on that last uh, number and indeed throughout the evening. Very happy to be playing tonight with Mr. Ricky Lawson. Another veteran of all of our touring bands of the 90s and uh, on into the new millennium on the bass guitar. Please welcome Tom Barney. <laughs> Currently seated at the uh, Fender Rhodes Piano, uh, a new member of our touring ensemble and also our recording uh, uh, group. Uh, please welcome Ted Baker. Moving over into the uh, female vocalist section, please welcome Ms. Victoria Cave. <laughs> Next to uh, Victoria, a fine vocalist who's uh, been on recordings with us and also toured with us in 1996, please welcome Carolyn Lenhart. <laughs> and also featured on our new recording and touring with us for the first time, uh, Miss Cynthia Calhoun. Uh, as far as two against nature, I think the whole concept of it. This is my, my, oh, yeah, this is my take on it. For this too. No, but I think it's just, it's all about like different people with with alternative lifestyles. It's like, you know, like Cousin Dupree is like, that's not in the norm. That's not every <laughs> every day, but it's, you know, it's just, it's not, I'm saying these are not like their experiences, but I'm sure they read and they know and they all, all of this yeah. stuff. And, and if they're true stories, you know, like shame is like, it's like my life story. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's just my take on it. Okay. Unlike a lot of artists that are out there, you know, Donald and Walter have a really good idea of what it is that they want. And you'd be surprised at the artists that are out there that really don't have a clue. These guys know what they want. They understand 
what a groove is about, <laughs> you know, placement of a beat. I mean, they just, they, you know, they're very complete musicians and, and, and artists in general. And that's a rare thing. Well, and it's probably the most musical gig I've ever done. Those guys are like a uh, hand in glove, truly uh, complement one, one another's personalities. Donald and Walter are the type of cats that uh, they want you to bring what it is that you do to the table as well, to enhance whatever the songs are and what the music is about. And that, you know, that I really enjoy about them. The way we actually ended up playing it was more, it wasn't really doing a ba da da da, you know, it's more just hanging on the chords, right? You can try, you know, kind of a break, Ricky, or whatever you want there. You know, just whatever it feels good. So that sort of, that sort of took the place of the actual intro. And as soon as everyone gets it, come in, and that, that's that you're in the intro already, you know. I mean, one of, one of the real special things about it is there's such density in the writing and you know extremely intricate harmonies and stuff and it's like really really interesting from a horn player's viewpoint i'm just i'm just kidding i'm just kidding you the man you the man and then then this is halfway through the bridge is where i am now the process of working in the studio with them is uh it, it's very experimental in a way it's it's very free and the process was was really relaxed and I was free to fool around with things if I wanted to and it was it was fun it was pure fun and then an a major nine see what I'm saying I was going using the pattern you know and then you got a C sharp nine and then flat nine while the music played you walk by candlelight those san francisco nights you were the best in town just by chance you crossed the diamond with the pearl you turned it on the world it's when you turn the world
gas tubes and the scale Still it all out of here It's the gas in the car This is gas in the car Think the people down the hall Know who you are Careful what you carry Cause the man is wild You are still in that car What is the Steely Dan policy about intra-band dating? As opposed to contraband dating. Yeah, or <laughs> extra-band dating. Extra-band dating is out. And um, intra-band well, intra uh, dating No is dating in. any yeah. extra-bands. <clears throat> we, we had a little memo about that on the website. I yes, believe, you did. Uh, I've seen it. <laughs> in 96. Um, yeah, it's under the, I think we called it the new chivalry. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was essentially a, uh, a attempt to... Uh, reinvigorate the uh, put some romance back in the uh, in the touring process for us mostly <laughs> there were there were some uh, you know um, there were some some, you know, some some disciplinary me measures in case some of the other band members you know over you know just crossed the line you know we didn't want anyone Extra making eye contact with no you eye know. contact right, with no the background contact. singers that kind yeah. of thing singers and you know uh, stuff like that I don't think they were like to speak to them either. Well, certainly not.
Pete, tell us a little about yourself, Pete. Well, let me just say, Pete. Pete is is not. Uh, we've had musicians in our band so far. Pete is not actually a musician in our band, but he has a very special relationship to 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 the band. So, okay, go ahead. Uh, what's my relationship anyway? I never figured that out. Well, that's why we're here. Okay. <laughs> uh, what would you like to know? Tell us a little about yourself. Uh, you know. What How are old you? are you? I'm 41 years old. Okay, and you're from. I'm from Long Island. Where in Long Island? Oceanside. Oceanside. Well, some Oceanside is nice. Yeah, it's it? pretty good. And uh, I like riding my bike. I like jogging. Right. I like watching baseball, and I was listening to Steely Dan records. And when did you start listening to Steely Dan records? Uh, when I was about 16. 16. So that's that was a, that's a little early, yeah. isn't it? That that really, well, we don't recommend that anymore, you know? No, and it affects the, uh, yeah. it affects you, I know, a lot. It's like what they used to say about Mad Magazine in the 50s. Yeah, you know? the new guidelines really um, call for a sort of uh, a completion or near completion of the maturation process. Mm -hmm. And to have at least a high school diploma as well is, it comes in handy too, but... I barely got that. So, you now Pete was at one time, uh, and uh, you may still be mm -hmm. the co-publisher uh, and author of a uh, fanzine, may fanzine. I call it that? Yes, it's the right name for called it. Called Metal Leg, which is, um, tell us tell us about Metal Leg. Well, it's a, it's a little magazine, about 30 to 40 pages, and it basically uh, follows you guys around. That's right. And, uh, and it's and got articles, and articles, it's got pictures, photos, and, and, uh, and false rumors. All manner of and, uh, <laughs> information in there. And not only that, it also has articles about people that we've worked with, or people right. that we've known, or That's people right. that... Uh, it's like the minute they work with you guys, they're, they're in the metal league, they're in the magazine. Right, we're influential at yes. one time or another, um, yes. and that sort of thing. And uh, in many cases, uh, I've, I've read uh, articles in Metal Leg magazine and found out I, I know more about those people than I ever knew before after reading the piece. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably good for you guys to get to know your players. Now, you also have Sometimes another job. happens to me. You have I another do. job. This is really a moonlighting thing. You have another job, right? Yeah, I'm a uh, music booking agent. Yes. And uh, I owe that to you guys for getting me into music. That's why I'm, I'm doing that as a profession. And I'm totally influenced by your music. That's kind of a shit business, though. I think you'd be sort of <laughs> no, angry at us. No, actually, that. no. I'm very happy with the truth. You have to it's deal with a lot of sleeves. No, I don't uh, book that many national acts. I'm okay. Just local mm. bands. Now, when you when let's say you let's say you you book a band for your club, right? Mm -hmm. And you've you've booked five guys or something. Then they show up and there's only four guys, or there's five guys, but not one of the guys that you thought you were booking, right. or there's some other sort of discrepancy, right. uh, um, some sort of uh, 
uh, irregularity right. that uh, you weren't expecting in the uh, gig and which can be traced back directly to the musicians. Mm -hmm. Is that when, I mean, how do you, how do you handle a I situation just take, like I that? I just take the money out of their pocket and put it in mine. Yeah, I see. so you, you, you get back at them through right. the pocket right. It's my, sort of. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. Their loss is my game. I say. Now, what's this thing down at, uh, did you still have that thing going on at La Bar Bat? Yeah, that's bar. Right. the bar bat. It's um, on 57th Street. It's the former home of Media Sound Recording Studio, which I don't right, know if you've right. ever recorded there or not. So yes, it was a the church there? Right, it was a church. It was the Manhattan Baptist Church before that. Then it was right. Media Sound, and now it's a nightclub. And that's where I book. Uh, I'm the exclusive booking agency. Um, right. And my, the name of my company is called Razor Boy Music because I had to name it after one of your songs because I owe it all to you. And is it well, true you book a lot yes. of people who are alumni of our band or who are Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people that have played on your records and that play with you now mm -hmm. will play there often. Mm -hmm. And the minute they, you know, I mean, we have a great time there. It's a great club. And um, among about, those, there's uh, also a band called the Steely Damned. I believe, yeah, the Dynamite. There. Yeah, the Dynamite. Yeah, the Steely Damned from, uh, from San Diego. San Diego. Yeah, they're real good. Yeah, they're pretty mm -hmm. good. Now, what are they like? What are the guys in the Steely Damned like? Are they nice guys? Oh, they're, they're very cool. I mean, you know, they're just, just big fans, you know, uh -huh. of the music, and uh, they play it real true to the records, you know, which mm -hmm. I see. I th see when you guys do it, you kind of like to change it up a little bit. Yeah, they, kinda, they do the. They kind of do it just like the records, right? The, Mm -hmm. Now, uh, among these musicians who are alumni of our band, are, are, have you noticed are any of those guys like mad at us? Uh, I better not say. I, there are definitely some people mad at you, but I'm not going to mm -hmm. say anything about that. Well, maybe without well, naming <laughs> without naming the individuals involved. No, because we understand. I, I yeah. wouldn't want you to become. Uh, you have to understand royal because no. I understand your situation in this. Right. So without without mm -hmm. in any way asking you anything that. Uh, would help, uh, that would identify any of these people. Let's just take uh, musician A who's mad at us. Forget about what instrument he plays. Forget about any identifying characteristics or name or anything like that. Why is he mad at us? Because you stopped using him. Because we stopped using him. Then. Mm -hmm. on, on, on records or Both on concerts? Records and concerts. Because we stopped hiring them all together. That's right. They're now, and, and so what, what is there, how do they interpret that fact? What, just, what do they think about that? We stopped hiring them because... Uh, just because uh, you guys messed up, it was just a mistake. It was a mistake. But what does what does person A who is mad at us? Why why does person A imagine what they think we were thinking? Like they probably didn't cut it. Oh, I see. So they're taking it sort of personal. as a personal right. a criticism mm -hmm. right. of, of their uh, of their playing. Right. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
John Harrington on guitar. All right, now, and person and, B who's mad at us, right. another musician, completely different musician right. who's mad at us, right. is angry at us because... Because you don't know what you want. Because we don't know what we want. No. <laughs> That's a very fair criticism, I'd have to say, wouldn't fair. you, Donald? That's well, what I, at this point, let me ask: of say, say, of say, out of say, say, there were ten musicians that you you book, that that were alumni. Out of the ten, how many of the ten would be mad at us? Uh, probably about three or four of them. Three or four. Yeah, under fifty percent. Yeah, those. I mean you're doing okay. In that so it's about thirty-five percent. <laughs>
back to this thing with the, because I think it's sort of interesting, the guys that are men. So here's a band that you've hired, there's say seven or eight guys in the band, right? 35% of them. 35% of least. them. Yeah. Uh, you know, so upset. three or four guys in a, in a, in a oh, typical yeah. band. But you're sort of is mad at us. You're using They're your coming in, and they're coming into the gig now, and now they've got to play all our songs, because that's what well, you've hired them for, when, right? When we find the guys that are playing that are mad at you, we try to play your music between the sets to get them even more pissed off. Get them to, to uh, with the right. theory the theory that, that that will goose them on right. to an even better performance. Right. Now, see, that's exactly what we that's think. That's what we do. That's yeah. what we think. That's, that's why they're mad at us. That's what it is. You know? See? Joking, son, where did you get the
very much. Uh, pretzel logic. Things can be really exciting, but you have to work at it to make every day you know, interesting. You know, it's not interesting all by itself, all the time. Not for me, anyway. And that's where irony comes in to a certain extent. And it's not that I think anyone really sets out to be ironic. It's a defense, you know, against, against you know, the sort of uh, uh, nature red and tooth and claw, you know? Is there anything to drink kind of in this car? Here, yeah, really. Yeah, especially after that sentence. Whew. Yeah. Any sentence that ends with the word claw. <laughs> and then a quotation mark. Is there water or something? Yeah. Yeah.